Hi, my name is Matthias Wienold. I'm Senior Fellow at the Northumbria University Centre for Crime and Policing, and it's my pleasure to kick off the online conference on DNA and police work. Today I'm going to talk about the ethical governance imperative for biometrics. In particular, I address three practice-based values I view as central to a comprehensive validation framework for introducing new biometric technologies into the criminal justice system. My talk is structured in three parts. First, I provide a tour de force of technology in society and in policing. Then, I consider three practice-based values in responsible ethical deliberation. And third, I argue for a three-pronged approach to validation. I think it's vital that we continue to talk about how to improve technology validation because it is so central to confidence in using technology by the criminal justice system. Okay, let's get started. Um, imagine a police investigation, border controls at airports, or the surveillance of organized crime or potential threats to public order without technology. You'll find it's become increasingly difficult to do so. In fact, when we think about today's criminal investigations, border policing, anti-terrorism activities, and so on, we tend to imagine these activities through technology. Fingerprinting, DNA profiling and databasing, camera surveillance, facial recognition, online tracking, listening into mobile phone conversations, you name it. Biometric technologies have become an integral part of what we today understand as policing. Policing, like many other social institutions that shape our lives, including healthcare, education and finance, is co-produced by technology. While there may be differences in their nature, purpose and understanding, technologies have become deeply embedded in how we live and experience social life, how we relate to each other, perceive of others, and in how we govern social institutions. Importantly, they are part of how we make sense of what makes a good society. Technologies have become an integral part of the politics of social life and what Andrew Barry has termed the technological society. When it comes to new technologies, a lot of work goes into imagining how they might impact on our lives, to shape them and change them. Sheila Jasanoff and Sang Hyung Kim coined the useful term socio-technical imaginaries to describe collectively produced visions of what makes a good society. These imaginaries help structure anticipatory work aimed at creating support for the development of technological capacities, for example, in negotiating plausible visions and proposing feasible programs of development. They do so by drawing on existing infrastructures and uh, experiences, social norms and values and so on, to assure potential users, regulators and other publics that new technologies and their oversight are legitimate and ethical, for example, that data are produced and used in such ways that they can contribute to creating public goods, including public safety, security and uh, criminal justice. But it's also of interest to ensure that these technologies do not do so um, unnecessarily or to large extent at the expense of human rights, civil liberties and social justice. Socio-technical imaginaries can therefore also work towards closing down or renegotiating support for technologies, depending on the vision of what makes a good society. That also brings me to the point that cannot be overemphasized when considering the technological society and novel biometric technologies for policing. Technology is never neutral. Technological considerations are as much embedded within the societal context as they contribute to the shaping of social order and practices. Forensic genetics technologies are products of decisions made, for example, about which populations to use as samples, what genetic markers to develop, and which data and data repositories to rely on in doing so, which theoretical frameworks to use in this work, what types of probabilities to consider most appropriate, how to train algorithms for the analysis, and how to develop reporting on forensic analyses. Similarly, Legal and regulatory frameworks emerge because of technological capacity and in turn shape them. An historical example is the UK's legal framework for setting up and using forensic DNA databasing and policing. It was signed into law only once lawmakers were persuaded that technical capacities were given, that DNA information could be turned into recordable and searchable numerical values. A more recent example is the discussion of forensic DNA phenotyping in Germany. 
where we could observe how political considerations around migration have helped drive new legislation enabling the use of this technology by police forces. Of course, enabling legislation does not guarantee that the technology can be applied reliably, usefully, or that its use is always justifiable. For that, we need ongoing validation processes. Policing generally, and investigative practices specifically, the market, both forensic services and technology development, and relevant expert, public and political debates constitute the deliberative horizon within which technological use and its oversight are considered, negotiated, materialized or closed down. They constitute the political economy of biometric technology for security and criminal justice purposes in society. Just how biometric technologies and policing can best deliver these public goods remains subject to deliberation between different communities, which must include not only science, law and criminal justice, but also the social sciences, ethics, minority and other interest groups, as well as policymakers. Within this context, we're witnessing a steep increase in the development of and desire for new forensic DNA technologies, including forensic DNA phenotyping, genetic genealogy, and um, forensic genomics. These technologies build on a rich and diverse field of population genetic studies and genomics research, fueling an expanding number of data sets available on often freely accessible research repositories. Meanwhile, the commercial and recreational market for genetic analysis has grown significantly, incidentally creating resources for policing purposes, such as the previously private and now commercially owned GED match database, which was used clandestinely in the Golden State Killer investigation. GD Match, by the way, is now owned by Virgin, which is a um, private forensic services provider. These data repositories are part of technological development towards large-scale data generation, agglomeration and analysis, frequently referred to as big data and automation. And that really signals significant step changes in the ways that biometric technologies can be applied. From individual instances to perhaps a more routine use, from a focus on an individual to one on communities, and from human to automated algorithmic analysis. And all of this raises awareness to an ever more complex political economy of forensic genetics and policing technologies generally. One in which research, state and commercial interests come together with questions of accountability, for example, around value for money, social returns on investment, efficiency, um, but also in terms of um, civil liberties, in terms of legitimacy, justifiability and trust. In this political economy, commercial technologies are looking for novel applications. Science is looking for new ways to fund research and to evidence societal impact of their work. And police are looking for novel methods to support their investigation in order to increase crime detection rates and deliver on limited crime investigation budgets. I'm now coming to the second part of my talk, introducing three practice-based values for the ethical deliberation of novel forensic genetics technologies. Since biometric technology use in the criminal justice system can have significant impact on victims and their families, persons of interest or, or suspects in their families, whole communities even, deliberation has to fulfill two requirements. It is ongoing, taking place at appropriate times, and it involves multiple perspectives, such as from science, law, policing, social sciences, ethics, minority and community representatives, industry, and so forth, ensuring that deliberation is informed, adequate, and equitable. The three values form the starting point for the three-pronged approach to technology validation I address in the final part of today's talk. They are reliability, utility, and legitimacy. With these, I propose to bring together insight from concrete knowledge about technologies with ethical principles that favor responsible innovation. They are based on three questions. Is the proposed technology reliable in delivering on expectations about its use? Does it provide utility to the task at hand? And who defines what is useful and what is successful use? And does its use satisfy questions of wider social legitimacy? Over the next few slides, I start to add some details to each value. 
Let's start with reliability. At an early stage in the development, a scientific reliability test is key. This must consist of at least two items. Reliability of the underlying science, per se, and reliability of the scientific process and data in producing the technology. Prior to adoption, deliberation needs to consider the veracity of data work, that is, how data are produced, curated, and intended to be used by the proposed technology, in order to address individual, institutional, and systemic limitations here. At point of considering technology adoption into practice, testing for user capacity is vital in order to ensure that the technology can be used reliably by police forces and other non-scientists in practice. There is necessarily overlap in the way that these um, values are applied, and that is vital to forming a comprehensive understanding of scientific and technological limitations that will impact on usefulness or utility. Furthermore, we need to work out what conditions have to exist in order to ensure a meaningful use. How can effectiveness and success be interpreted? At this stage, it is also important to consider what social impacts might the use of this technology have. If the application of a policing technology is likely to decrease public order, for example, in suggesting that a particular community is involved in a crime and that community then becomes subject to abuse by others. The technology's use needs to be organized in such a way that it can mitigate such effects. This could involve introducing new measures such as community policing, communication training, adapted information policies within police forces, and so on and so forth. A vital aspect of utility concerns the information that can be garnered from the technology. The use of technology should be subject to investigative needs. This is of relevance to both time and financial budgets of police investigations. Legitimacy is about establishing whether a particular technology should be used in the criminal justice system at all, and what social domains it will affect or draw on. A current topic of analysis here would be of health and lifestyle related markers for use in the criminal justice system. Importantly, we need to ask why a particular technology may be proposed, what the context of its deliberation is, in order to situate arguments for or against the adoption of a technology. Relatedly, at this point, good practice needs to be identified and prepared for. In the end, ethical deliberation needs to be clear about investigative and communicative practices, training, infrastructures and oversight that are necessary to ensure good use of the technology and its data. At times, this will require significant further efforts and investments before technology can be used responsibly. Reliability, utility and legitimacy provide a pathway for technology deliberation. They are dynamic values that have emerged from practice-based processes of valuation. Drawing from the three values, in the third part of my talk, I address the need to consider technology validation in a more comprehensive manner than it often is. In the forensic domain, validation is generally associated with reliability tests and data validity. Validation here consists of a range of standardized and standardizing practices that contribute to the material governance of technology. The field of forensic genetics is an excellent example for just how important validation is to its function. It can help boost confidence in the underlying science and, importantly, help build up trust in technology used by the police and for criminal justice purposes. Recent calls for open forensic science and transparency in forensic science reporting have started to link scientific validation concerns around data reproducibility and accessibility to wider criminal justice values. Arguably, validation is a much wider issue than just getting the science right, as I have shown in discussing reliability, utility and legitimacy. It also needs to look at how the police and others can use the technology and its data in a broader sense, and how their use is justifiable. As such, I argue that validity has broadly three meanings that are relevant to any practice-oriented discussion of technology. These three meanings reflect on the need to understand validation as ongoing and cross-domain. The first is scientific validation. As it's used most widely today, the concept describes the scientific processes and tools by which a technology is tested. 
questions here can be, what can the technology do in a technical sense and how does it achieve that? Standards and baselines for technology use and data analysis tend to act as parameters for such validation. This suggests that validity is stabilized temporarily. For one, lab tested technologies and so-called ideal type applications may not reflect, emulate or take into account the messiness of applications in operational practice. For another, as scientific knowledge as well as social practices and science and around technology use change, scientific validation achievements become destabilized and need to be renegotiated. These limitations are incorporated into scientific practice, but are difficult to communicate to technology users and regulators not familiar with that practice. Therefore, operational validation, the second strand, is necessary and needs to be expanded. Current practices of scientific validation build on collaboration between scientists and police science laboratories to test how police labs can use the technology. However, this part of validation does not measure the values that technology has for intended tasks. These values are of an operational nature. For policing, this includes investigative and legal aspects to help deliver public safety, security and criminal justice. And they include aspects such as the usefulness, efficiency and efficacy of relying on technology in investigations. Users need to be aware of the limitations as well as opportunities and the circumstances under which it is useful and effective to deploy the technology. Operational validation needs to be expanded to include the testing of how investigators and police forces would manage data and information they receive from using new technologies. One test of this validation stage could include if current training is sufficient to prepare and support investigators to understand the reliability, utility and legitimacy aspects of the forensic information they may receive. This brings me to the third type of validation. Validation also takes place outside technology R&D, forensic laboratories and technical guidance. It is just not usually perceived as such. This vital kind of technology negotiation explores social and ethical values that are drawn upon and affected by the use of technology. The nature of social and ethical values is emergent. They are products of processes of evaluation. See, for example, the value of legitimacy I discussed earlier. Even when the use of a specific technology is not legal at a point, it may be seen to be legitimate by some to deploy it in order to achieve certain public goods such as public safety, law and order, justice. That these uh, public goods are likely to be shared by broader publics. However, they are not absolute goods. They are relative in that, for example, they can create an uneven level of burden and benefit, with some communities getting more out of technology use and others losing out on public goods. Taking this into consideration is particularly vital for biometric technologies, even for technologies already in use. DNA databasing places greater burden on minority communities, as does forensic DNA phenotyping. Genetic genealogy places burdens on very wide, familiar relationships between people who may not even know each other. And forensic genomics, with its indicators for health and lifestyle, will place greater burdens on those with a variety of morbidities. We can say that validation anticipates technology users as well as their governance. By using specific processes and tools, and by prioritizing some values over others, it simultaneously creates hierarchies of views and governance. However, the three validation processes are integral to ethical governance of biometric technologies. We need to see them as aspects of one practice, that of ensuring that technology is reliable, useful and legitimate to use. A focus on just one or two creates gaps that will impact negatively both on policing practices and on trust in policing. It would mean failing those who may be using biometric technologies, such as genetic genealogy or automated facial recognition, and those who may be subject to their use, which to be fair is likely to be many of us at some points in our lives as consumers, users, travelers, family members, and so forth. So this proposed understanding of validation, a comprehensive validation framework based on reliability, utility and legitimacy, I think supports us in considering new biometric technologies, including DNA ones, in a more sustainable, fair and democratic way.
Thank you very much for watching this presentation. And if you've got any comments or suggestions or would like to collaborate on ethical governance of um, biometric technologies, then please do get in touch. Thank you.